Welcome back to the third lesson of the Zig Basics course. In the last video, we talked about the program lifecycle and how every program relies on hardware to function, all under the watchful eye of the operating system. As promised, today we're diving into the world of hardware and we're starting with none other than RAM, random access memory. In this video, we'll explore how data types live in memory, why memory size matters, and of course, we'll introduce the magical concept of pointers. Yes, they can be a bit tricky, but we'll make it fun. This is just the beginning of our hardware journey. In the next video, we'll move on to the CPU and learn how it handles all those calculations and logic operations. And then, we'll wrap it all up with a discussion on files, storage, and how your data is safely stored on the hard disk. So buckle up. We're about to make sense of all the pieces that come together to make your code run like a well-oiled machine. Let's get started with RAM. To understand this better, let's talk about one of the most important relationships in your coding journey. The relationship between RAM and programming. It's like a secret partnership that makes everything happen behind the scenes. So, what exactly is RAM doing while your program is running? Well, every time your program needs to store or retrieve data, RAM steps in like the ultimate assistant. Quick, reliable, and always ready. For example, when you create a variable like this, What's happening here is that the value 42 is being stored in a specific location in RAM. Every time your program needs to use my value, it knows exactly where to find it, in RAM. And because RAM is super fast compared to other forms of storage, it makes accessing data a breeze. But here's the catch, RAM is volatile. This means that once you turn off your computer or stop the program, everything stored in RAM is gone. Poof, it's like a whiteboard that gets erased once the power is cut. That's why we use other types of storage like hard drives for permanent storage, but we'll get into that in a later lesson. Now let's talk about something that often gets overlooked but is super important, data size. When you declare variables in your program, they don't just magically float around. They take up space in memory, and that space is measured in bytes. But what is the byte? The byte is a unit of memory, and it consists of eight bits. What's a bit, you ask? Well, a bit is the smallest unit of data in a computer and can hold just two values, a zero or a one. That's it. Think of it like a light switch that's either off, zero, or on, one. Now, when you combine eight of these bits together, you get a byte. With just a single byte, you can store numbers from zero to 255. This may not seem like much, but with enough bytes, we can store all kinds of data, from numbers to text to even entire images and videos. Now, imagine RAM as a huge table with rows and columns. Each cell in this table is made up of bits. Since each byte consists of eight bits, every cell in this table can hold eight little switches, either zero or one. Now let's pause for a moment and take a deep breath. Well, I have a question. Let's say I want to store the number 42 in a variable like this. How does this number turn into just zeros and ones? Isn't that strange? What we type and see with our eyes is completely different from what's actually happening behind the scenes. Honestly, this feels more like magic spells than programming instructions. Anyway, to answer that question, let's break it down. In binary, the number 42 is represented as 101010. This is how the computer understands and stores it in RAM. Each bit in this binary sequence represents a power of 2, and by combining these values, the computer can reconstruct the original number. So even though we type 42, the computer translates it into something that fits its digital world of zeros and ones. This is the core of how all data is stored and processed, whether it's a number, a character, or even a complex image. It may seem like magic, but it's really just a very clever system of encoding information in a way the computer can understand. But wait, what about text? For instance, how does the computer store a letter, like the letter A? Is it the same as storing a number? Or is there a different system involved for characters? Let's dive into that next. When it comes to storing text, computers use a character encoding system, the most common of which is called ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange. In ASCII, each character is assigned a unique number. For example, the letter A is represented by the number 65. So how does that work in binary? In binary, the number 65 is represented as 01000001. This means that to store the letter A, the computer actually stores the sequence of bits in memory. Each character has its own unique binary representation, allowing the computer to understand and display text correctly. So, just like with numbers, when we type A, the computer translates it into a series of zeros and ones, allowing it to store and manipulate text in the digital world. Isn't it fascinating how everything, from numbers to letters, boils down to this binary system? But here's a thought. 
If letters are stored as numbers, how does the computer distinguish between a stored letter and a number? For example, if we have two variables like this, one variable contains a number and the other variable contains a letter. If we try to print these two variables, we'll see that the first variable represents 65 and the second variable also represents 65. But wait, why is the numeric representation of the letter A printed instead of the letter A itself? Well, to better understand the matter, we can refer to some examples from the mother language, C, which Zig was primarily built upon, along with C++. Also, I have a special fondness for C and C++. I've spent more than 10 years building many of my own imaginary worlds using these languages. It doesn't mean that because we're explaining and learning Zig now that C or C++ are no longer valid or good. Quite the contrary. For example, years ago, I was hacked, which led to the theft and destruction of all my projects. And recently, in one of my recovery attempts, I retrieved an old version of a project I had worked on many years ago using C++, aiming to provide better better, faster, and smoother performance. When I retrieved it, I temporarily uploaded it to my personal GitHub account, the place where the curse began and which caused the destruction of that period of my life. But I won't delve into those details right now. If you want, we can dedicate an episode to that topic later. But overall, I intend to complete this project in the future. However, at the moment, I'm more interested in Zig for personal reasons, one of which is that I needed a language to start this series and to capture attention. I found that Zig is popular and cool, and I kind of liked it. Now let's take a look at how C++ handles this scenario. In C++, we can define these two variables using the car type for the letter and the int type for the number. Using car, we explicitly tell the compiler that this variable represents a character. The same applies to numbers. When we deal with numbers, we use the int type. What does that mean? In this case, the car type indicates that the variable should be interpreted as a character. So the print function in C++ knows to display the letter A instead of its numeric value 65. To make sense of this, think of the print function as a filter machine. It receives different kinds of data and processes, each one based on its type. It needs a way to recognize or tag these variables so that it can handle each one appropriately. In C++, the types like car and int act as those tags. But I think that's not enough to clarify this concept. So let's now move on to the C language. At this level of abstraction, C provides a powerful set of data types, such as character and integer, just like in C++. However, printing these values in C requires a bit more precision. When using the print function in C, you need to specify the type of data you are printing using format specifiers, like %C for characters or %D for integers. If you forget to specify the correct format specifier, the print function won't automatically know how to display the character A, so you need to explicitly tell it what type of data it's dealing with. The difference lies in how C handles these representations. In memory, all data, whether characters or numbers, is stored as a sequence of bits, zeros and ones. The format specifier instructs the function on how to interpret and display those bits. The key takeaway is that print relies on these format specifiers to properly interpret the data, while C++ uses a more automatic approach with STDC out, thanks to operator overloading. In both C and C++, we can achieve the same result when it comes to printing characters or numbers, but the approach differs. C++ is more convenient with STDC out, while C requires more explicit control through format specifiers in print function. Now let's return to Zig and clarify how it resembles the C language, while also highlighting the differences between the two. Understand Understanding one programming language can significantly enhance your ability to explore and benefit from others, making it easier to grasp their concepts. In Zig, while it may seem like the built-in print function can automatically infer types, it actually behaves similarly to the print function in C, in that you still need to specify how you want the data to be interpreted. For example, if you want to print a unsigned 8 bits integer type as a character rather than a number, you must use a format specifier much like in C. Now it's time to explore data types in Zig. To make things simple, we'll divide the types into several categories, starting with integer types. This category contains several different data types, which can be split into two subcategories. For instance, if we take a closer look, we'll notice that half of the types begin with the letter U, while the other half starts with the letter I. The U stands for unsigned, meaning that the value stored in this variable cannot be negative. On the other hand, the I stands for integer, meaning it can store both positive and negative whole numbers. But Wait, why do we even have unsigned types if we already have types that can store both positive and negative values? Let's break it down by looking at the 8 bits integer type. 
Imagine the 8 bits signed integer type as a line that holds both positive and negative numbers. In the 8 bits signed integer type, the range is split between negative and positive values. On the left side of the line, you have the negative values, going down to negative 128. And on the right side, you have the positive values, going up to plus 127. The 8 bits signed integer type uses 8 bits of memory, which means it can represent a total of 256 values, from negative 128 to positive 127. Types that begin with the letter U, like 8 bits unsigned integer, doesn't have negative values. Instead, all values are positive, starting from 0 and going up to 255. So why would we ever use unsigned types? It's simple. If you know you won't need to store negative values, you can use unsigned types to gain more space for positive values. For example, instead of splitting the range between positive and negative values, as in 8 bits signed integer type, you can use 8 bits unsigned integer type to store a larger range of positive values from 0 to 255. And now let's pause here because this video has gone on longer than I expected. We'll continue covering the remaining data types and dive deeper into concepts like memory, pointers, arrays, and even lists in part two of this lesson. I'm sure you won't want to miss it, so stay tuned. And before we wrap things up, I want to give a special thank to Space for being the first to support the channel. Your contribution truly makes a difference and means a lot to us. If you'd like to support the channel as well, you can find donation links through PayPal or Ko-fi in the description. Until we meet again, don't forget to like the video and leave your thoughts in the comments. Honestly, when there's not enough engagement, it feels like I'm talking to myself in front of a mirror. Your comments and feedback would really make my day. So, see you in part two of this lesson.